das war ja gerade auch der Grund gewesen, weshalb die... That was precisely the reason why NATO reacted so angrily when Federal Councilor Maher ordered the withdrawal of the Swiss contingent from Afghanistan. This also somewhat undermined the justification for this mission, which at some point no longer had anything to do with the legitimate national defense of the United States. In other cases, NATO didn't even bother to obtain a legal justification in the form of a UN Security Council resolution, but simply acted unilaterally, applying the law of the strongest. It is now apparently about us Swiss retroactively approving this. Hello everyone, this is Pascal Lotas from Neutrality Studies again, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with a fellow countryman. I have with me Mr. Ralph Bosshart, a professional officer with general staff training in the Swiss Army. Mr. Bosshart studied history in Zurich and then served many years in the Army. In 2013, he was in Russia for language training and to attend the general staff course of the Russian Army. Yes, that was still possible back then. There was still cooperation with Russia. From 2014 to 2020, he was then a military special advisor to the OSCE Secretary General working in Austria and Ukraine. Mr. Boschard is one of the critics of Switzerland's rapprochement with NATO and is an advocate of a functioning neutrality policy. That's what we want to talk about today. Mr. Boschard, welcome. Gladly. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mr. Bossart, could you perhaps first briefly tell me something about your background? How did you experience your stay in Russia back then, just before the Crimea crisis, that is, before the Ukraine crisis, before everything escalated in 2014? What was it like for you as a Swiss in the Swiss Army to be in Russia for an exchange? Yes, of course, it was highly interesting. We were dealing with the old adversary from the Cold War. We met many officers who had been stationed in the GDR during the Cold War, when I was a young non-commissioned officer and young officer. In Moscow, I not only met Russian officers from that time, but also officers of the National People's Army of the former GDR. I found that they think very similarly to us on many practical issues. Fundamentally, they are very reasonable people. A second highly interesting aspect was, of course, the acquaintance and collaboration with officers from the area of the former Soviet Union, especially Armenians and Central Asians, some of whom I came to greatly appreciate. And then, of course, comrades from all over the world. I can very well remember two Nicaraguans, an Angolan, and a group of four or five Vietnamese with whom the exchange was naturally highly interesting. Also, discussions about contemporary history, how they experienced it and how they see it, in contrast to how we see it. That was undoubtedly one of the most interesting years of my career. Back then, in 2013, that was still possible. At that time, Switzerland was also cooperating with Russia. That all certainly collapsed after 2014. Today, Switzerland only thinks about cooperation with NATO. Do you consider this a loss of know-how and capabilities for the Swiss Army? Absolutely. Absolutely. We send officers on these so-called long foreign deployments so they can engage in experience exchange. In doing so, the experience exchange usually doesn't go from the Swiss to the foreign comrades, but the other way around. They are supposed to benefit from the knowledge that other officers have acquired in crisis and war situations. Before my long foreign deployment, we also asked ourselves what the point was of constantly sending officers to NATO. There, they only learn counterinsurgency and crisis management, because those are the topics that Americans and Western Europeans train in.
Und, uh, and in doing so, neglect the classic themes of national defense. The classic national defense was, conversely, the focus of my training at the General Staff Academy in Moscow. We practiced defensive operations 70% of the time and offensive operations 30% of the time. Topics like crisis management, interventions in foreign countries, and counterinsurgency were never an issue. Quite different from what my comrades in Switzerland believed I supposedly did in Moscow. Of course, there was the discussion about hybrid warfare. Currently in vogue. Today, I would urge that we engage in knowledge and experience exchange with countries outside of NATO, with countries that have had the misfortune of having to wage war. I can imagine that in the area of peacekeeping, colleagues from the African Union have a great deal of experience and could teach us many useful things if we were willing to accept it. Our Western European arrogance and conceit might also be preventing us from doing so. But focusing solely on NATO is certainly not beneficial. You experienced it live. Did this shift towards NATO from Switzerland, which is more obvious today than ever before, start before 2014? Or was 2014 the starting point for Switzerland towards NATO? No, no, absolutely not. That began, if I look back, already in the mid-90s, under completely different circumstances than today. In the mid-90s, after the collapse of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union, it was believed that all of Europe's problems could now be solved amicably in cooperation with NATO and Russia. That was when the peacekeeping euphoria immediately arose. We quickly considered to what extent we would participate in such operations. That was still acceptable at the time. When I then became a professional officer in 1997, it was naturally also a topic concerning my career. For example, do I go with K4 to Kosovo? That was the big issue back then, ex-Yugoslavia. And back then, this rapprochement with NATO began because it was the only military alliance left on the European continent. At the latest, the problems in former Yugoslavia, especially in Kosovo, and the illegal attack on Serbia should have prompted a pause and some reflection. Even the founding of the Collective Security Treaty Organization with Russia, Belarus, Armenia, and a larger number of Central Asian countries at its core did not trigger a rethinking process. Thus, we have increasingly focused on NATO uncritically. The disaster in Kabul in August 2021 should definitely have caused a reversal at the latest. But now the opposite has happened. Since 2022, Switzerland has been politically aligning more and more with NATO. We have now adopted several strategy papers from the Federal Council, that is, the Swiss government. They state that we want cooperation with NATO on all levels. They also use the word interoperability. It even goes so far as to seek certification from NATO to ensure that their own structures are NATO compatible. And when I read that, and it is a security paper, a strategy paper, my hair stood on end. At the same time, our federal council says that they are not striving for NATO membership, except if attacked, in which case neutrality is null and void, and one must immediately shoot back. It seems to me as if Switzerland is preparing a bed and only pretending not to be tired yet. I don't quite understand it. Can you explain what is happening politically in the decision-making rooms of the Federal Palace? In the decision-making rooms of the Federal I can very well imagine that. I have partly experienced it myself. There are still unanswered questions from the early 90s at the center. 
During the entire Cold War, we were told that we needed a Swiss army to defend ourselves against the Warsaw Pact if necessary. Then, of course, came the peacetime after 1991. After that, it was said that there was no longer any immediate military threat to Switzerland. I particularly experienced this in the leadership staff. It was said that we need to maintain our competencies. That is certainly correct. We need to preserve our knowledge and skills so that we might be able to conduct a defense operation in 20 years if necessary. But fundamentally, such a threat is not right at our doorstep now. We would have done better to clearly state what we mean by maintaining competence for defense. That was one of the favorite terms of Federal Counselor Samuel Schmid, then head of the Department of Defense. Instead of searching for a new enemy, which we have now found again in the form of Russia after a long search. I was with the Russian army long enough, longer than many Swiss conscripts are with the Swiss army. Afterwards, I worked daily with Russian officers in Vienna for three years. I think I can judge well what the Russian army can and cannot do. And what it definitely cannot do is march into Bern in 14 days to play the balalaika in the Federal Palace. That is not possible. But that is what they are trying to make us believe at the moment. It is crystal clear to me that it is fundamentally about freeing up funds for the army now, because there is a perception that it is underfunded. The head of the army, Thomas Susley, likes to peddle this theory. It is about obtaining additional massive armament credits, which in my view are not justified in any way. This desperate search for a new enemy has brought us to this point. Desperate search for a new enemy, and also desperate attempts to fit into a narrative. Do you agree with me on that? Because I somehow have the feeling that Switzerland, at least the official Switzerland, and a good part of our political establishment, more or less in the middle, but also on the left side, I would exclude the SVP on the right side from this are trying to fit into this narrative that the West is now in danger and virtually under attack, and that the potential enemies are Russia and to a lesser extent China. And that now one must prepare within NATO, and that Switzerland actually also belongs there, with Sky Shield and with integration into various operational areas. And that now a NATO liaison office is to be opened in Geneva, which officially is only supposed to cooperate with international organizations. But no one can tell me that it won't also be used for communication with Switzerland. That Viola Ahmed, our defense minister, repeatedly went to Brussels and met with the NATO secretary general. These are all signs that actually raise red flags for me. Yes, exactly. Aufschnellen lassen, aber das anscheinend im Moment in der Schweiz auch noch immer mehrheitsfähig ist. Wie bewerten Sie diese, dieses, dieses doch radikale Umdenken der Schweizer Politeliten, die im Kalten Krieg noch ganz anders waren? Ja, wir müssen ganz klar sehen, unsere politischen Eliten sind schwach. We must clearly see that our political elites are weak. It is relatively easy to put them under pressure. This is certainly also an inherent problem of the Swiss federal state. We have never liked having a strong federal government. The politically determining organizations in this country are still the cantons, and they have never liked a strong federal council. Additionally, it exacerbates the situation that the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Department of Defense in Bern do not enjoy a high reputation within the federal administration. The newly elected federal councillors are then pushed into this DDPS, or this FDFA. Viola Amherd made it very clear once that she would have preferred a different department. To put it quite bluntly, she is fundamentally the second choice for this job. But I naturally ask myself, 
Who is still a Swiss defense minister if one so submissively yields to NATO colleagues? They are, of course, putting enormous pressure at the moment, that is clear to me. After the debacle in Kabul in August 2021, which I have already mentioned, NATO was under pressure. Many people then asked themselves, what is the point of all this? Kabul was also merely an outward expression of a failed strategy with which NATO tries to dominate security events far beyond NATO's external borders. They would probably prefer to do it across the entire Northern Hemisphere. One had to redefine oneself to maintain cohesion. The Ukraine crisis came at just the right time. The opportunity to show strength here was, of course, a godsend. The main task of the next NATO Secretary General will be to keep the ranks closed. This can only be done by painting a bogeyman on the wall, by conjuring up an external threat. This way, the member countries, which now have completely different security interests, can be kept in line. Why does Switzerland believe this? Why do our political elites believe this? During the Cold War, the Federal Council and the Swiss political system were no different. It was the same political system. But during the Cold War, there was unity in the federal administration. The fundamental pillars of the Binshedler doctrine stated that one should not get involved in international entanglements that would, in a serious case, prevent one from holding back. That was a consensus, I would say. And that seems to be gone today. The entire mindset today, when I read these white papers, is based on the idea that everything is already being prepared to be able to strike back together with NATO. And that, for example, it is not defined what would be considered an attack on Switzerland. So whether a cyber attack would already be interpreted as an attack, or whether an attack on a NATO member country that affects Swiss citizens would also be considered an attack, and whether in such a case it would be permissible to retaliate together. That worries me extremely, but it does not seem to be on the agenda of the people currently making this policy in the executive branch. Parliament recently decided on something new, but we will get to that in a moment. How do you see it? Well, at the moment we are leaving important decisions or are about to leave important decisions to others. You mentioned the key word cyber attack. What is a cyber attack? When does it become strategically relevant? When does it become so relevant that a state government has to deal with it? We know that certain European countries such as Great Britain clearly believe that a cyber attack would justify a conventional physical strike in extreme cases, even the use of nuclear weapons. Then there are the Swiss citizens abroad, whom you mentioned, who of course also occupied us at the time in the army's leadership staff. This is also a phenomenon that has become more pronounced since the end of the Cold War. Today, more Swiss people live abroad than probably ever before. But if we believe that we have the right to intervene worldwide to protect Swiss citizens, then we must be clear that we are not the only ones who think this way. Many other countries think the same. If this mindset takes over, it leads to interventionism, a catch-as-catch-can, situation where everyone believes they can quickly strike somewhere. These rescue scenarios were also a major topic for the Swiss Air Force and Special Operations Forces. In the end, we did not practice it. More because it is not feasible militarily and technically than from the realization that we would thereby undermine the international order. I think a generation of politicians in Switzerland who have supposedly only witnessed the shining NATO victories since 1991 believes that they must now participate. However, I can still very well remember that, for example, 
The much maligned federal counselor Whaley Maurer relatively clearly recognized that the NATO mission in Afghanistan had little to do with peacekeeping anymore, but rather with suppressing uprisings. He then also withdrew our contingent, consisting of two men. This greatly angered NATO, I witnessed that. It was also Maurer and the Security Policy Defense Department in Bern who waved off Swiss participation in Operation Atalanta. You may remember when the fight against piracy off the Horn of Africa was under discussion. At that time, the pirates certainly understood that it was not about combating them, but rather about a naval buildup in a strategically very important region. Switzerland then waved it off and said that it did not want to be involved in power games. Now we have at the head of the departments, both the defense and the foreign affairs departments, people who are very focused on the EU, like Cassis in the EDA. These are people whose competence I would question, who now believe that one must participate. This is more an expression of these people's perplexity than of their strategic understanding. Two weeks ago, there was a decision in our parliament, in the National Council, the larger and more important chamber in the Swiss system, to prohibit the Federal Council from getting closer to NATO. As far as I understand, the matter has not progressed further. It is now with the upper chamber. If it goes through like this, it would be a strong signal from the people's representatives that this is not desired. That is the first point. The second point is that we have a popular initiative that will likely come to the people relatively quickly by Swiss standards to strengthen Swiss neutrality. Do you feel that at the moment, perhaps in 2024, we will experience a pushback from Parliament and the people? Yes, I have that impression to some extent. People are beginning to understand what the alternative to neutrality would be. The alternative to neutrality would be participation in geopolitical games and ambitions. Germany, for example, sees itself as an Arctic power. German military aircraft regularly fly as far as Greenland. I didn't know that Schleswig-Holstein is so close to the North Pole that the German Bundeswehr absolutely has to be active there. I also experienced it myself in Vienna, how the Baltic and Polish view the Eastern policy of the EU and NATO. And that would be the second alternative for Switzerland, namely participation in any actions that serve to restore the Grand Duchy of Poland-Lithuania from the 15th and 16th centuries. I was surprised myself when I heard about such theories, that old ambitions of Józef Piłsudski from the 1920s are being revived. This intermarium concept, which stretches from the Baltic Sea over the Adriatic to the Black Sea, is a political thought experiment. They would like Switzerland to participate in it. Then, of course, I heard about the extended Mediterranean of our southern neighbors, Italy. According to the Italian view, the extended Mediterranean stretches beyond the Horn of Africa deep into the Indian Ocean and in the northeast to the end of the Sea of Azov, almost to Rostov-on-Don. And then I was also often invited by the French colleagues in Vienna to participate in Francophonie events, where the French quite clearly stated that their interest extends to West Africa and the Gulf of Guinea. So that is the alternative to neutrality, which people will hopefully slowly understand now, namely interventionism, from the Arabian Sea, over the Gulf of Guinea, to the Sea of Azov, up to the Arctic Ocean. Once people in Switzerland understand this, they will be more likely to support the neutrality initiative. This neutrality initiative is already putting some pressure on the political establishment, which also explains the behavior of certain parliamentarians, as you mentioned.
So, I am glad that we have this system. Perhaps for the explanation for all German listeners. In Switzerland, there is the possibility to force a vote on specific changes to the Swiss constitution through a popular initiative. The government and parliament can no longer oppose it if enough signatures have been collected, unless there are formal errors. But this has only happened three times in Swiss history. Most popular initiatives go through. The fact that this initiative can force a discussion on how neutrality is interpreted is extremely important. The crucial point in this vote will be whether the issue of sanctions should be part of the neutrality policy or not. The opponents of the neutrality initiative do not argue that we must immediately join NATO in Switzerland. They argue that we should remain neutral while maintaining cooperations with NATO, and that the issue of sanctions should not be part of the understanding of neutrality. I am among those who say that sanctions are instruments of war and that one should not actually use them unless forced to do so. Und die, das tut man eigentlich nicht, außer man ist dazu gezwungen. Außer, und das lässt die Initiative übrigens offen. Also die Initiative and by the way, the initiative leaves this open. The initiative is often misrepresented because it is said that we would only adopt UN sanctions. But there is a second loophole. And that is, if we ourselves could come under secondary sanctions, then it is still permitted to impose necessary measures to prevent the circumvention of measures by friendly states. So we have a second way out there. But the fundamental question is, sanctions in neutrality, yes or no? And what is your stance on this question, since it is not primarily military? Yes, exactly that is the problem with the term neutrality today. The last legally binding definition of the term neutrality comes from the Hague Convention of 1907 on the rights and duties of neutral powers in war. This agreement is almost exclusively about the military and partly also the military economic aspect of neutrality. That corresponded to the needs and the spirit of that time. In the meantime, of course, much has changed. The sanctions you mentioned have become almost omnipresent. Although economic and political sanctions were originally an instrument reserved for the League of Nations. The League of Nations wanted to bring peacebreakers to reason after the First World War. In this sense, the UN rediscovered and utilized this instrument after 1945. Sanctions then move very much in the direction of acts of war. You are absolutely right when you consider that, under the laws of war, a blockade of a country's coast is considered an act of war. One must naturally ask whether economic sanctions at some point have the same effect as a naval blockade or a land blockade. Um, in the interest of maintaining the global international order, I think it is right that Switzerland and generally neutral states should only participate in political or economic sanctions if there is a corresponding decision by the UN Security Council. Economic sanctions are often the means of the supposedly economically stronger against the weaker. They are ultimately just an expression of the law of the jungle in international relations. However, we do not want this law of the jungle. If the law of the jungle applies militarily, the militarily strong simply prevail against the weak. After two world wars on the European continent, this cannot be the idea of a new international order. People who disagree with us would now automatically argue, but Mr. Bossard, at the moment we have the situation where the militarily stronger Russia is overrunning and trying to destroy the militarily weaker Ukraine. In such a situation, one must at least take an economic stance. One must show their colors and say, no, we are standing against the evil Russians and we are standing up for a just peace. One must take the side of just peace. How do you respond to such objections? How do you respond to such objections?
Yes, if a just peace were the goal of all these actions by the EU and NATO, then I do not understand why NATO did not present a convincing peace plan at Bergenstock. At the moment, we have a Ukrainian peace plan for the Ukraine conflict. This logically includes the Ukrainian maximum demands. Then we have a Russian peace plan. This naturally corresponds to the Russian maximum demands. This will not surprise anyone. Then we have a Chinese peace plan. The Chinese are very patient people. I met many of them at the General Staff Academy in Moscow, but they are also very self-confident. I think the Chinese will not simply throw their peace plan into the trash now just because it is not being discussed at the moment. They will continue to insist that their peace plan, possibly with certain changes, be implemented. So if it were really about peace, then Joe Biden should have come to Bergenstock, and he should not have delegated Kamala Harris, who has not stood out at all in the last four years. She probably spent four years in the White House cafeteria, but certainly not at events relevant to foreign policy. Then Ursula von der Leyen, Chancellor Scholz and President Emmanuel Macron should have also presented a convincing peace plan. To me, it rather seems that the West is intent on harassing Russia. They have found a country in Ukraine that is willing to do so and are supporting this country to the best of their ability. Surely in the summer of 2022, it was believed that an easy victory over the Russian army was possible. This hope was not fulfilled. This was evident in the fall of 2022. And now there is complaining. Ukraine is no longer being brought into a better negotiating position. I think, as Switzerland, our position must naturally be that we can never fundamentally agree to the dismemberment or elimination of a UN member state. This means that the existence of Ukraine must not be fundamentally threatened by Russia. Conversely, we must also reject all those who are now again considering theories about the necessity of decolonizing Russia. You call it that. In reality, it is about the disintegration of Russia into pieces. We must reject these theories. It is those who engage in such thoughts, not only in Warsaw, but especially in Warsaw. You may have heard of the Prometheus strategy, also from Piłsudski in the 1920s. And now some professors are traveling around the country, talking about the decolonization of Russia, and that the poor Buryats, Nenets, and Chechens must be freed from the yoke of Moscow. We as Switzerland must also resolutely oppose such efforts. Then there was an attempt to address the problems of Ukraine, which cannot be ignored. These were the Minsk agreements from the fall of 2014 and February 2015, which were negotiated with Swiss involvement, by the way. Heidi Tagliavini played a role, but Austria also played its part. We now need to get the conflicting parties to return to the Minsk agreements and possibly eventually come to a solution beyond the Minsk agreements. These are not perfect, but they were once a generally accepted basis for solving Ukraine's problems. And we need to go back to that. Let's briefly touch on the problems that arise for Switzerland from the fact that we have already participated in certain NATO missions, specifically the K4, the deployment of Swiss army personnel in this peacekeeping mission in Kosovo, which is based on NATO enforcing that the right to self-determination of a region outweighs the territorial claims of the state from which they come, in this case against Serbia. And now, when it comes to Ukraine, Switzerland seems to stand behind the other principle. So the sovereignty of Ukraine prevails over the wishes of the populations in Crimea and also those in Donbass.
Bevölkerungen in, auf der Krim und ge, auch denen im Donbass, weil also es ist relativ klar, dass in diesen zwei Regionen So, it is relatively clear that in these two regions, even without political interference from Russia, an overwhelming majority is not happy with what happened in Kiev. The two regions are different and have different desires. These desires are now officially no longer considered legitimate by the Western side. In this case, it is not the rights of minorities that prevail, but the rights of the state. And Switzerland has indeed exposed itself in this regard. Do you feel that we can still get out of this dilemma, or that we are now simply stuck with the wishes of the West and selectively apply what is currently desired by Brussels? Yeah, yes, this danger certainly exists especially since NATO and also the EU should actually have a bad conscience in view of the numerous actions of the past 30 years that were in violation of international law or legally problematic. If the well-known principled and treaty-compliant Switzerland were to side with NATO, it would of course retrospectively cast these problematic events in a better light. That was also the reason why NATO reacted so angrily when Federal Councillor Maurer ordered the withdrawal of the Swiss contingent from Afghanistan. This also somewhat removed the justification for this mission, which at some point had nothing to do with the legitimate national defense of the United States. That may have been the case for a while after the attacks of September 11th, but at some point the mandate's limit was far exceeded. In other cases, NATO didn't even bother to obtain a legal justification in the form of a UN Security Council resolution, but simply acted unilaterally, applying the law of the strongest. Obviously, the aim now is for us Swiss to retroactively approve of this. As for the population in Crimea and Donbass, I was already in Crimea and Donbass before the conflict. I was there on behalf of the OSCE, many times I can't even tell you how often. In Donbass I was in Kramatorsk, Donetsk, Mariupol, Skalitsa, Luhansk, all these cities and villages that are now being fought over. And I have personally witnessed the resignation of these people. They never had any illusions about the quality of the central government in Kiev. They always said it was a corrupt clique. Especially the people in Donbass said, we in our industrial region are also financing this corrupt clique, which then repays us by kicking us in the teeth. The extremely weak governance that the Kiev central government displayed over 20 years took its toll in 2013. At some point, people said, yes, you can speak badly about Russia, but it can't be much worse than it is here. And the people from Kharkiv always had contact with the people from Belgorod, and the people from Mariupol were in active exchange with the people from Rostov and Taganrog. The Donbass region alone is cross-border. It also includes Russian cities like Kamensk, Shakti, and others in the official border area. Whether we as Switzerland now need to help a Ukrainian government, ob wir als Schweiz jetzt helfen müssen, einer ukrainischen Regierung zur Rückgewinnung der Kontrolle über diese Gebiete zu To help regain control over these areas, fully aware that governance will be poor again, is a question I have been asking myself for a long time. Fundamentally, the conflict between the right of peoples to self-determination and the territorial integrity of states is a classic international law conflict, which we also experience in the Caucasus and Central Asia. That is why I find it so important that we find a reasonable solution to the problem of Donbass and Crimea, because it will set a precedent for resolving numerous other conflicts in the area of the former Soviet Union. Solving this conflict solely with violence would be an extremely bad example for resolving other conflicts. We as Swiss must insist that a reasonable solution is found here. That is our task.
Yeah, of beide Seiten, also of beide Seiten drauf. Yes, on both sides, insist that the solution ultimately be a political, a diplomatic solution, and not the law of the strongest. But for that, you first have to sit down and talk, and unfortunately we are not there yet. Mr. Bosshart, do you regularly write somewhere on a platform? Is there a place where our viewers can follow you? Yes, of course. I often and gladly publish on the portal globalbridge.ch by editor Dr. Christian Müller, who, by the way, was once the editor-in-chief of the Luzerner Neuen Nachrichten, editor-in-chief of various editions and products of Ringier Media, a true professional in his field. Die Weltwoche has already published articles by me twice, and also Kontrafunk, which is especially popular in Germany. Good. I can recommend Global Bridge to everyone. Christian Müller does an excellent job here, and repeatedly has great texts, including those by Ralph Bosshard. So subscribe to Global Bridge. It is a homepage that is simply open. You can just read it. It is a pleasure. And they have a newsletter that you can subscribe to. Ralph Bosshart, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome.